Welcome to Wall Street Prep's video on how to build a basic discounted cash flow model. Before we jump into the model, what I'd like to first do is go over from a high level perspective what a DCF entails and why we use it in industry. So a basic DCF model involves projecting future cash flows and discounting them back to the present using a discount rate that reflects the riskiness of the capital. You then add up all of those discounted cash flows and the sum is really the intrinsic value of the company. And so many people in industry compare that value to market values to determine if something is overvalued, undervalued, or valued correctly. So it really is an important form of valuation and almost all people in finance use this valuation to a certain degree. It's also worth noting that there are many different variations of the DCF, but there are generally two different types, unlevered and levered. Unlevered DCFs are before the payments of debt, and that's actually what our model is. So you'll see we're dealing with items like EBIT, EBIT, which means it's before the payments of interest as well and debt pay down. Uh, levered, on the other hand, is after interest expense and after debt pay down. Given that unlevered free cash flow analyses are the most commonly used, we're going to focus on that for the purposes of this video. For more information on levered, you can check out online or some of our other videos. Now, you'll, so now that we know more about the DCF <clears throat> and we know about why we use it as well as what it entails from a high-level perspective, let's take a stab at our first section, which is the free cash flow buildup. Now, if you've created a model before, you know that you might have a financial statement model that precedes the DCF analysis. And in that model, you've got a forecasted cash flow statement. So you're probably wondering, well, then why do I even need to do a free cash flow buildup if I already have that basic FSM? And the answer is because cash flow from operations does not include the important capital expenditures that you see here. And we know that free cash flow, by definition, is operating profit less reinvestment, reinvestment being capital expenditures. So while a lot of these other items are common to the CFO section of a cash flow statement, it is missing a critical element, which is the CapEx. So that is why we need a cash flow buildup, as you see here. The next thing you're probably wondering is, well, why have we forecasted for five years? The real answer is, well, it depends on when your company has stable earnings. So we're assuming that in five years, the company will have stable earnings. So typically, practitioners forecast cash flows anywhere between five and 10 years. And even if you've got a company that is mature, like a Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, or GE, it's still recommended that you do five years so you can see the cash flow build up. Now that we understand sort of what this section entails, it, let's go ahead and start building it. So we're going to go ahead and reference revenues from our select operating data schedule. And I'm going to control copy this, paste special the formula, and I'm going to do the same thing with EBITDA as well as EBIT. Okay, we're going to go ahead and reference EBIT now. Again, this is an unlevered free cash flow analysis, so it's before the payments of debt. Now, given that taxes are not an optional thing, you have to pay taxes to the government, we're going to focus on EBI, which is earnings before interest after taxes. So we take EBIT and we multiply by 1 minus the tax rate to find the after-tax value of EBIT. Another word for EBI that you might hear is NOPAT, and that's net operating profit after taxes. Next, in order to go from EBI to unlevered free cash flows, we need to make several adjustments. Those adjustments include adding back non-cash expenses and subtracting out non-cash gains, making our accrual adjustments, and then subtracting out our, uh, our reinvestment, which is capital expenditures. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to add back our non-cash expense, expenses, which in our case is just DNA. So again, control copy, paste special the formula. Now, as you recall, when, we, when you build a cash flow statement, an increase in an asset is viewed as a use of cash, while an increase in liabilities or equity is viewed as a source of cash. Now, I know that accounts receivable, when we increase that, it's hard to really picture why that's a use of cash. So I'm going to explain it from a different angle here. And that is that 
We know that from cash versus accrual accounting, revenues includes both sales made on credit as well as sales made on with cash. So in other words, if our credit sales increase, that's going to indeed increase revenue. But we know that we're not actually receiving that cash yet. We're going to receive it at a later point in the future. So if our accounts receivable goes up, we need to make the necessary adjustments to EBIT to reflect the actual cash that is coming in, which is only cash sales. So therefore, an increase in accounts receivable will need to be deducted from EBIT to correctly reflect cash coming in. So one way to do this would be to do uh, the first forecasted year minus the previous year, but you need to make sure to add a negative sign to that value, otherwise you won't have the correct signage. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do previous year minus the first forecasted year because that will automatically embed the sign. Now, the beautiful thing is in our model is that accounts receivable inventory and prepaid are all right underneath each other. So I don't really need to do much more here other than control copy downward. And I can use what's called a control D function which is a built-in Excel function. So I do control D, and then I can do control R, which is also an Excel function. And you can see it populated without me having to reference the balance sheet data constantly. Now, accounts payable being a liability, uh, an increase in that represents a source of cash. So I'm going to do first forecasted period minus previous forecasted period. And again, if you look up on our schedule, accounts payable and accrued are right underneath each other. So all I need to do is simply reference these two rows here in the free cash flow buildup. I could do control D and then control R. Again, both are Excel functions. Now regarding capital expenditures, they are an asset. So an increase represents a use of cash. Okay, now what we need to do is we're going to add EBIT, DNA, our working capital adjustments, as well as CapEx. And uh, you'll see that we have WAC here. WAC, we're going to actually go ahead and calculate later, so we're going to leave that blank for now. But we can still figure out the present value of free cash flows, which is unlevered free cash flow divided by 1 plus WAC raised to the period. So we go ahead and control copy, paste that. You'll notice that the present value of free cash flow hasn't changed. Why? Because we haven't calculated WAC yet. And so our sum of present value of free cash flows is the sum of all those cash flows that you see discounted back to the present. And this is what we call are stage one of the free cash flow analysis. And enterprise value is the sum of stage one and what we call stage two, which we'll talk about momentarily. So as you can see, we've now built up our free cash flow for the explicit forecasted period, i.e. stage one, and it's now time to focus on what we call stage two, which is the terminal value. Terminal value represents all value beyond the explicit forecasted period, so from year six onward. Now, it's hard to use uh, a basic discounted cash flow uh, formula to, to, uh, to calculate terminal value given that it extends into the future, long into the future. So we, there's really two different methods to calculate terminal value. The first one is what we call growth in perpetuity, which is what we're going to do in our model. And the second is what we call exit EBITDA multiple method. But we're going to focus again on growth in perpetuity. Terminal value is a value that's assumed to exist in year five. And so uh, we're going to have to apply the discount factor from year five to this terminal value to arrive at the present value of stage two. And our enterprise value will be that stage one plus stage two. And so now that we know what terminal value is, let's go ahead and, uh, and, and calculate it. So our WAC, again, will be calculated later on. So our free cash flow in T plus one is going to be this unlevered free cash flow times one plus the growth rate. 
we take that free cash flow and we divide by WAC minus the growth rate. Again, growth in perpetuity. And the value looks funny now because we haven't calculated WAC yet. As you can see, we're going to do that in a later section. So the present value of terminal value is going to be this terminal value divided by 1 plus the WAC from the uh, fifth period raised to the fifth power. Again, because it's like terminal value from a discounting standpoint happens in 2017. Again, don't worry about this value yet. It will, uh, it will fix once we add in our WAC. So this concludes our part one of this series. Part two, we're going to go ahead and calculate WAC. Uh, we're going to link that up top so that our, our stage one as well as stage two uh, fixes. And then we're going to go from uh, enterprise value to equity value. So I'll go ahead and see you in this next video. Thanks for watching.